Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He was a utopian, an educational reformer, a transcendentalist, an abolitionist. He's buried in Author's Row in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery with his friends Emerson, Thoreau, and Hawthorne. She was a Civil War nurse, a suffragette and abolitionist, and in 1880, one of the first women to vote in the United States. She's the beloved author of an American literary classic, the Harry Potter of its day. They were Bronson and Louisa May Alcott, and they are the subject of John Madison's Pulitzer Prize winning dual biography, Eden's Outcast, the story of Louisa May Alcott and her father. John is professor of English at CUNY's John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Welcome, John, and congratulations. Well, and thank you, Doug. It's terrific to be here. You get a Pulitzer Prize. First of all, where were you? What was it like? Talk to me. Well, let me set the scene for you. It was the afternoon of uh, April 7th. 2008. Of this year, exactly. And uh, there was a John Jay faculty meeting going on at the entire college. And it so happened that Chancellor Goldstein was there. He's been doing a tour of the various mm -hmm. colleges. And April 7th was his day to be at, uh, at John Jay. So I was sitting in this rather large gathering in the uh, lobby of our theater. And uh, someone came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you have to leave this room now. It's an emergency. So I'm thinking, oh my um, gosh, what could possibly right. happen? I'm going down the list of people who Right, died. the bail, the bid. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So I get outside, and there's our department secretary. And she says, well, the reason you have to come with me is that there's a photographer coming from AP. You've just won a Pulitzer Prize. And I said, look, this is six days late for April Fools. And, you know, right, and, yeah. and wait, wait, what did you feel? Goosebump? What? I mean, what um, was... If, I, did you ever remember seeing Bjorn Borg when he won Wimbledon? How yes. he'd always sink yes. to his knees, hands yes. over the face. Yes. That was me, yes. quite literally. Okay. Yeah, I was just really overwhelmed. And so I, uh, I uh, tiptoed back into the meeting, tapped my department chair on the on the shoulder, told her what was going on, and then I, I took off. And then she was then able to announce it to the. And, uh, fortuitous timing. For the chancellor's there, and you get the Pulitzer Prize. Fortuitous indeed. Yeah, I, I, I only wish I could have been there. But okay, was, talk a little bit about yeah. the Pulitzer Prize and sure. how you get nominated, and uh, you know the nature of the voting. Okay, sure. Um, Getting nominated in itself is actually no big deal because all that really means is that your publisher has sent three copies of the book to the Pulitzer Okay, so in a sense, it's, it's self-nominated. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so then whatever stack of biographies or poetry collections or history uh, works uh, goes to a uh, three-person jury, often composed of people who've won the prize in the past mm -hmm. or have been finalists, and they typically choose three books then to send to the Pulitzer board. Uh -huh which consists of people like Tom Friedman at the Times, right. uh, Donald Graham from Washington Post, the editor. You know, but nobody knows yeah. to, until it's announced who these three people are, who, who the winners are. It's, it's, not, it's not like the Oscars where you get nominated and it's a big deal, right. and then a couple of months later they have the show. Exactly. They announce the finalists at the same time that they announce the winner. So there's no tension. And there's you no don't build know. Up. Right. So it's totally publisher's clearinghouse. They just show up, or, and, and there you are. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before we get to the, the Alcott's, biography. Sure. You have an interesting biography. You went to Harvard Law, yeah. you practiced as a litigator, and then you leave the law and want to become a professor? Yeah, some people thought that was kind of strange at so the time. So you applied yeah. to grad school, right? and tell the story. Uh, well, I, I made the decision to go back to graduate school for a number of reasons, but one of them was that um, I you didn't like the idea of surrendering my moral autonomy in the workplace. Because when you're a lawyer, your morality you're becomes right. that of your client. Okay. Yeah, basically right. so. And also being tyrannized by the timesheet. I'm a really disorganized person. I, I would get, you know, three oh, weeks. You can't tell from this. Come on. <laughs> I think this belies that claim. Go ahead. Okay. But anyhow, I, I saw what 
uh, what practicing law seemed to be doing to some of the you know, more senior people in the firm. What, and you know, had these nervous tics that kept pulling at their hair and stuff. And I thought, that's not who I want to be. And then the really corny thing happened. I know you're interested in movies, but um, I saw the Kevin Costner movie, Field of Dreams. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm running out of time to build my ball field. Oh, yeah. nice metaphor. Hey, well, thanks very, very much. Very good. Yeah, and I, I thought, you know, what do I really want to do with my life? What I really want to do with my life is to read good books and write about them and talk about them. And get them. paid to do it. Exactly. Hey, come on. Yeah. Okay, it's so you apply to grad school and? And uh, the response was thunderous. Uh, six no's and one yes. But the, the, the yes was a good yes. <laughs> the yes was from Columbia, yeah, uptown. Okay. And, uh, and then how do you get to John Jay? Uh, also, John Jay yeah. Criminal justice? How does, you know, Louisa Malka, criminal justice? Ah. Okay. Um, so many things just start sort of uh, by happenstance with a knock at the door. Uh, a colleague of mine in graduate school knocked on my door one, one evening and said, here, there's this ad in the Chronicle of Higher Ed for a literature and law professor at John Jay. I think you'd try for it. Mm -hmm. So I did and went through the interview process and, uh, as you know, did not get the job. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was I was up against uh, Angela Davis's lawyer. And that was a little bit too much PC cred Ooh, for me to. Oh uh, man, <laughs> yeah. that's tough. Yeah, so uh, so she. Got so you don't get the job, right? But I sent a thank you letter to course, the chair of the department. Guy. As everybody does, I, you know. I the, understand. Uh, the, you know, those of you watching at home, the importance of being earnest and decent and and manly. Thank you. Come there on. There you go. And um, the chair of the department, um, you know. You know, apparently read the letter. I also said in the letter, look, if you ever need somebody to fill in, I'm right uptown. Okay. And so I got a phone call that August, like August 15th, right. two weeks before of classes, course. saying we've got you two. got a hole in the schedule. Exactly. We've got two sections of comp, two sections of modern European lit. Four courses. Do nice. You, yeah. Do you Very want nice. And so absolutely I said yes. So okay. That's how that's going. Okay. How do you... How do you get to the Alcotts? How, what, is, what was it about them that attracted you? How did you come to this biography? Okay, well, what happened was I wrote an article in a uh, sort of scholarly journal called the New England Quarterly, mm -hmm. uh, which had nothing to do with the Alcotts. It was about Emerson and Daniel Webster and uh, Herman Melville. But a couple, once again, happenstance. I get a phone call two weeks later um, from an agent. He's read my article and okay. says, do you want to write a nonfiction book? I said, okay, let me check for five seconds. Yes, absolutely. Oh, right, 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 right. So um, initially, we thought that I would write a book about 19th century utopias in general. Okay. And you know, of course, from reading the book, that Bronson was a founder of a utopia. Right, Fruitlands, and, yeah. and, and, and an observer of other utopias. Uh, absolutely, Go ahead. yeah. So I, um, uh, I started my research with that one in particular. Right. It took me a very short time to realize, you know, this guy is so interesting that I'm not going to be able to say about him all the things that I want to say in this format that I've mm -hmm. chosen for myself. Right. And also, I was very intrigued by the fact that here's this guy who's rubbing elbows with Emerson and Thoreau, is Hawthorne, a, yeah. William Lloyd Garrison. Yeah. Is a big deal in his own right. Right. But then he also fathers a daughter who grows up to write Little Women. Right. And, you know, you can think of a few other pairings of father and daughter in American history, you know, Henry and Jane Fonda maybe or something like that. Right. But they're not that common. Right. And another thing that was interesting to me was that Alcott really cared a lot about parenthood, much more so than just about anybody of his time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and his theories of education are really fascinating. Yeah. But at the same time, there's, there's, there is an off-centeredness about him. I mean, at, yeah. at one point, he has a breakdown. I mean, yes. he's, he's crazy. Um, to a certain extent, yeah. Okay. Yeah, very, Let's, you know. So you, you decide to write this biography. Now, yeah. one of the fascinating things is this notion of journal keeping. This yeah. family, I mean, he writes thousands of pages in journals, and the rest of the family writes hundreds of pages of journals, yeah. and they read each other's journals. Right. And what was that like to get mm -hmm. into their most intimate thoughts and feelings? Well, to begin with, it's really overwhelming. You go to the library in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where all of these things are, uh -huh. and you ask for them. They bring them to the table, and each one of them is this thick, and it's got clippings from newspapers and clippings of you know, members of the family's hair and things like that. It's a little bit daunting to know even where to begin. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, people who've, who've read the book have uh, sometimes remarked, wow, you read everything they ever wrote. 
absolutely not. It's not possible because, uh, as you say, every member of the family at one time or another was keeping a journal. Mm -hmm. um, not only Bronson and Louisa were publishing books, also her, um, I don't mention this in the book, but her younger, uh, younger sister, uh, May, also writes a book about oh. how to be uh, an artist and survive in Paris, like, you know, the cheap places to eat right. and things like that. The fromers yeah. of her day. Yeah, yeah, very much so. So um, with such a literary family, you do have to be a little bit judicious selective, and, and selective about what you do choose to write about. So, yeah, there are these other biographies of both uh, Louisa May and her father. Yeah. Why, why did you pursue this family? I pursued this family because it reminded me a lot of some of the things that I'd been through in my life. You know, I think that in some ways, biography is almost always autobiography. You dig deep enough and you'll see why people are drawn to particular people. I was drawn to Bronson and Louisa for one thing because I also have a daughter who's very inquisitive and very independent minded, mm -hmm. the way that Louisa sure. is. Sure. And I got this crazy idea that if I wrote a book about a father and a daughter and how they interacted, right. it could help me understand how to be a better dad. And then at the same time, being a dad would help me to read between the lines of the journals and the letters and kind of see what was going on. Wait a on. minute, but then there's a real parallel between you and Bronson because he originally puts together his journal to understand the relationship. There you go. So there's an go. element. Not only does Louisa May write Little Women, which is semi-autobiographical, right. you're saying that in a sense your, your quest into the Alcott's lives yeah. is... Yeah. Driven by your biography. If Very you will. much so. And also my desire to get kind of emotionally in touch with where my father was coming from, who was a sort of a, a, a distant, very demanding guy. And so right Clyde this, Bronson. Yeah, very much. So uh, in a in a way, a sort of an attempt to to make peace with that situation. Interesting. Well. Yeah. The psychology of the authorship. Okay. Yeah. What are the joys and frustrations of writing biography? The frustrations of writing a biography, I'll do those first because they pop into my mind right. faster. Is and there are more of them. Yeah. You never are able to know everything that you want to know. Right. You're limited to whatever happens to have survived the ravages of time. Right. You know, one uh, question people ask me is, well, why isn't Mrs. Alcott in this book more? Because she was marmy and little women. She's so important. Yeah, but she's, yeah. I would almost argue it's Louisa May Alcott and her father and her mother because she yeah. really is mm -hmm. a a. a profound character in this story. Very much, but the reason that she gets pushed into the shadows, and I'm not the first person to do this, is that when she died at the age of, I think, 77, mm. Louisa destroyed almost all of her journals That's and right. letters. That's because right. Bronson was a very public guy as far as the family went. He wanted everyone to see his experiment with the family and so forth. Thousands of pages worth. Exactly. Whereas Louisa, who actually is the one who becomes famous, hates the spotlight and well, doesn't want the intrusion. Well, we'll talk about the, the father-daughter yeah. relationship. Yeah. I mean, is this father-daughter literary relationship unique in American letters? I can't think of another one off the top of my head. You know, if I were to, to sit down and, 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 and think it out, there are other very interesting pairings between fathers and daughters. Uh, one of them is um, Harriet Beecher Stowe and her okay. father, Lyman Beecher, right. who okay. was a big time preacher, almost the Billy Graham of his yep. time. Yep. And so that's one. Also, um, and we'll probably talk about this later, Margaret Fuller, her father was a congressman and was prominent during what was called the era of good feeling and so forth. But I love those stories of family and conflict because there's always conflict between Oh, and there's and clearly father. conflict between Louisa May and her father in yeah. terms of a number of things, one of which is work and earning a living and, yeah. you know, just the, the, yeah. the economics of poverty, if you will. Well, absolutely. You know, on the one hand, he could not figure her out because she was the tomboy of the family. He had these perfect ideas, he thought, of how to raise totally polite, lovely, well-combed children. And here she's climbing trees and she's trying chewing tobacco on the side, you know, on the sly, and she's not fitting the mold. And so he doesn't know what to do with her. But at the same time, she becomes very important to the family because Bronson, you know, after his breakdown, certainly was almost unfit for employment. Right. And so it's the daughters and also Abba who are going out into the workplace and they're teaching and they're taking in laundry and they're doing everything that they can think of to get some food on the table. Okay. What, what has influenced your writing as writing? I mean, you're, you know, you're a writer. 
Mm-hmm. Who do you read? Do you read biography? Are there, yeah. are there, are there any influences on how you approached it yeah. or how you wrote it? Sure. You know, I'm starting to read biography a little bit more, but it was never a a genre that previously attracted me all that much. I'm really a novel guy. That's what I most enjoy. Mm -hmm. But um, I find that I'm not really able to write novels because I'm at a loss when it comes to thinking up original stories. But if you give me an archive and you give me some letters and you give me some facts, Ooh, then I can tell you the, the work story. of scholarship, that's a lo- and that's the joy of it. You asked me earlier, what's right. the joy of writing right. a biography? Is taking these um, seemingly dead documents and putting flesh on the bones, restoring them to a life and a vibrancy that people in 2008 can still care about. Give them gives them flesh and blood, in, in fact, as well Very as much. as well as the skeleton. Sure. Okay. Bronson, after his breakdown, makes a career of being a conversationalist. Yeah. What? I, explain the yeah. phenomenon. Sure. Under, are there any modern analogs to being a conversationalist? I don't know if there particularly are. Maybe you could supply some. But Bronson did not see himself as an orator. He was not the guy who stood at the, up at the podium and held forth with a deep bass voice like uh, Daniel Webster would have done okay. or something like that. His idea of conversation. Uh, And these were events that he would advertise in advance. He would sell tickets. He would come into usually an intimate area, someone's parlor. Right. He would be sitting there with a glass of water. And he's not the only one, but among the more famous of his time. Absolutely. Margaret Fuller did this as well. Okay. But uh, but, he would start with just a general topic, and he would improvise. He would basically jam. He was sort of like a jazz musician in that sense. And he's in your living room, almost like some of the TV and Internet and and cable folks are in your living room talking about the events of the day in the business. Very much, but also with audience interaction. You know, Ooh. people were encouraged so to, it's to interrupt okay. him and so forth, and try to refine the idea as the as it went forward. Okay, so he's a conversationalist. Yeah. What would you want to talk to him about? In your research, yeah. you've got questions and sure. on air. What What do you want to talk? You have an afternoon or an evening yeah. with him. What do you talk about? What's your question? Okay, one thing in particular is that you know we talked about his utopian community. Bronson kept journals. Fruitland. Yeah. And the joke is, you know, it's like a California cereal. Fruits, nuts, and flakes. (laughs) Exactly. And that's what you had at Fruitlands. It was a wacky group of people. Talk about talk about your original interest in Utopia and Fruitlands as the outgrowth of this. Oh my gosh. Can I can I I mean then let's get back to the original (laughs) question is what would you talk to him about? Yeah. I think a lot of people at one time or another have this fantasy of opting out, of getting off the grid, of turn on, tune in drop out. You're too young. Yeah, no, I, I kind of remember that. Okay. But, uh, um, Timothy Leary, right? Yes. Yeah. And, Very uh, good. And, and Bronson was a sort of hippie before the letter. You know, he wanted to go back and get close to the land, but he was also vegan because anything that involved an animal was exploitation. They couldn't wear wool. They could not wear wool. They'll use animal labor, use manure. They had to wear flax because... Exactly. And they would not use cotton because because it was produced by slaves. Exactly. And they were very strong abolitionists. Yeah. So Bronson is trying to live out this perfectly moral, ethical life in which no one is harmed, no one is exploited. Well, the problem is he ends up really kind of harming and exploiting his own family. because and certainly his wife, because yeah. the women are doing the work and the men are philosophizing. Sure. Someone asked Abba, his wife, you know, are there any beasts of burden at Fruitlands? And she re- replied, only one woman. Wow. Yeah. She's a so, remarkable character oh, as yeah. well. So what are you talking to him about? What am I talking to him about? One is... During the period that Fruitlands went on, he was hey, writing... What, what, what are we talking about? Okay, Eight, this is 1843. 43. Okay. okay. And it, it's a couple of months, six, seven months. Yeah, seven months, basically, before winter hits and it goes belly up. Okay. Uh, but um, he's keeping journals, like mad during this time. And then he loses them. Right, and on yeah. some kind of trip. And yeah, he's they're... going on a trip to, to show these journals to other utopians. And they disappear. And they ride off in a stagecoach. Oh, and, and he never gets them. Right. Like, like exactly. the worst airline experience. Sure. Go ahead. So I would love to ask him, you know, what was in those Ooh, journals okay. to the best of his recollection? Okay. Because it's the most fascinating moment of his life. And we only really know about it from what other people wrote. Louisa wrote a short story about it. Um, we've got journal of, journals of other people. But Transcendental Oats, is that the Transcendental story? Wild Oats. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then Hawthorne 
uh, satirizes it la later on with the Blythdale Blythdale romance, romance. yeah, okay. which is also making fun a little bit of Brook Farm, which was a much more successful. And then you have utopian. the Oneida community. You have this yeah. utopian thought, which really yeah. goes back to the founding with yeah. Winthrop's City on a Hill. So yeah. you've got this utopian strain, not only of in literature, but yeah. in practice. Sure. It tends to pop up in America about, I would say, every other generation. You get this big pulse of people who want to, you know, fight the system or, or just you know, opt, opt out. out of the system okay. precisely. So, but the other thing with Bronson is if I had a chance to talk with him, I would just want to bring a tape recorder and say, all right, talk. Talk. Because he was renowned as a speaker and he's not very good as a writer. You know, some of his journals are really riveting, but when he tried to write a book, boy, it was just not his thing. Okay, now yeah. let's let's turn to Louisa May. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what do you want to know? I know yeah. I know you have, you're interested in this whole notion of whether she was bipolar or not. Yeah. What do you talk about, and what are you interested in knowing? Yeah, I would find her a lot harder to talk to, in part because she was so resistant to the spotlight. I think if I showed up at her door saying I wanted to interview her, she'd probably turn the garden hose on me or something, you know, and just say, "Get the heck out of here." But um, I. Once again, I would be very interested just to have the conversation, to sit down as you're kind of doing with me and say, okay, what's on your mind? And, um, yeah, and also to know what books she didn't write. You know. Meaning? Meaning that, a couple things. One was she, of course, acquired this reputation after Little Women as being the great writer for children. And she enjoyed that because it brought her money. Right, right. But she also referred to it as writing moral pap for the young. And it was Ooh. not what she had wanted to do as an author. She really wanted to be more like Hawthorne. She wanted to write novels for grown-ups. And she did a couple of them. But then she got so sucked in to the financial success of the kids' books. And also she had periods of very ill health that prevented her from fulfilling all right, of her Right, I mean, objectives. she was poisoned with mercury as a Civil War nurse. Exactly. So uh, the, the good writing time that she had, she often felt that she had to devote to these money-making projects. She did pot boilers, very much, essentially, yeah. Yeah. and sold to the market. And yeah. but going back and reading at least the, the the pieces that you know are in here, and you know the, the little bit of homework that I did, yeah. that very interesting stuff. And then been written pseudonymously. I mean, you know, yeah. uh huh. And not even discovered. Nobody knew outside the family that they were that hers. They were hers for about a century. And then there were these two wonderful women, who both of whom have now passed away, Madeline Stern and Leona Rostenberg, and they lived up here in the, in the East 80s. And, uh, and it was Leona Rostenberg who made the connection and was finally able to prove that all of these bodice-ripping, you know, blood-and-thunder stories were actually Louisa's. Interesting. And, yeah. And, but then she writes a book that, that was, as I, I, I characterized it in, in the opening, the, the Harry Potter of its day. Yeah. But it's one of these books that's a true classic in terms that it's still read. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and there are still being operas made. And, and films. And, yeah. well, I, I mean, how, there's been movies, there's plays. There's Catherine Hepburn, Elizabeth Taylor, Winona Ryder. Yeah, everybody wants their crack and, at being in Little Women. Talk about, sort of, this is really a digression, yeah. the movies in relationship to the, how, what's your reaction to the movies? Well, you know, the, the one that I know best is the most recent, which is the Winona Ryder, right. Susan Sarandon right. one that I absolutely love. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, I'm not as, unfortunately, I'm not as well versed in the Katharine Hepburn one from the 30s mm -hmm. and the Elizabeth Taylor one from the late 1940s. But um, it is a a story that really does translate wonderfully well to film and to stage. There was a, a Louisa, uh, there was a Little Women right. musical on Broadway right. that's, that closed far too soon. Sutton Foster was fabulous in it. And um, my, my wife uh, and daughter took me there, I think, for Father's Day a couple of years ago. And and I was, I, I'm a real sap because I was in tears before the curtain hey, went Hey, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I could do the same I didn't thing. even wait for Beth what to die. What is it about the work that retains its vitality and speaks to not only women, but yeah. men as well. I mean, I read mm -hmm. it with my, my wife and I went to grammar school together in the eighth grade. Yeah. And we were talking about it mm -hmm. in reference to this interview. Yeah. Well, what it, is it? Well, I think it stands out from many of the other classics of American growing up. I'm thinking of Huck Finn, Catcher in the Rye, maybe a separate piece. Right. Mm. All of those are novels about sort of a failure to grow up. 
right? right. Huck can't deal, sure. so he goes out to the sure. territory. Holden ends up in the metal hospital. In separate piece, the main character dies. Dies, yeah. And the, what happens in Little Women is it's a successful navigation of childhood. Right? right, and then yeah. and talk about, you know, it's really two parts. I mean, there's, yes. there's, there's Little Women and then there's part two. And yeah. it's only until later that they become one one volume. That's right, yeah. And they're very different books because the, the first one really is much more about childhood and the second one is more about young womanhood. Right. And, uh, and Louisa also, after having written part one and able to write it basically any way she wanted, was then under... And an extremely, excuse me, an extremely short period of time, a couple of months. Yeah. One yeah. of her vortices yes. that, that, that she goes into, which right. almost zones out and just writes. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and she had that issue. That was the way that she wrote. She would just suddenly fall into this almost fit of creativity. She would almost stop eating. She would stop sleeping. She would only leave her room to go for a run to work off the excess energy. You said this was almost... A do you work like that? Um, Do you go into these deep? No, it's not really that the the same way. I I try to parcel it out a little bit. I try to you know put a couple hours in in the morning when I'm you know before breakfast usually. Right. Discipline um, though. Yeah, very much okay. so. What's next? What's next? What's next? I mean, yeah. how do, first of all, how do you top a Pulitzer and what's next? Oh, my gosh. Well, the, the Pulitzer, in a way, takes some of the pressure off because now, you know, whatever I do for the rest of my life. You still they, have they, it. They, they can't okay. take that away from right. me. But at the same time, there is this pressure of now being on the same stage with other people who've won the Pulitzer Prize for biography. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about Henry Adams. Right. We're talking about John F. Kennedy. Right. And Charles A. Lindbergh, who's a great hero to my parents' generation okay. and so forth. Yeah. And, um, and how do I justify being next to them? I've got to do something more. Wow. Right? So what do you do? You have 30 seconds. <laughs> I am going to, I hope, um, write other biographies that, that come up to the same level. I'm working now on a book on Margaret Fuller. Who, Who's one of the contemporaries yeah. and associates of the Bronx. Exactly, and, and perhaps the first important American female intellectual and early feminist, also someone who had a contentious, difficult relationship with a father. So you see this returns <laughs> Absolutely. to the fore. Uh, and I find her utterly fascinating. She was a prodigy as a child and spent her life in part trying to figure out how you stop being a brain and how you start becoming a person. And so that's pretty How far are you into this and when can we expect it? Uh, I'm working on it as fast as I can. It's, um, I'm, I'm hoping to get it done in the next couple years. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you so and much. Good luck. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.